The following presentation is brought to you as a courtesy from Forex Academy. This is part of our service, Live Beginners Course. If you find it interesting and wish to be updated on new releases, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or join our community at forex.academy and receive all our services for free. Your like is also highly appreciated. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Live Beginners Trading Course here with Webinar 3. Today we'll be discussing the essential knowledge, so look forward to today's lesson indeed. I'm of course your host here, Robert Blackwell at Forex.Academy. And do, before we do begin, please uh, consult the following disclaimer and be aware there is risk inherent to trading in financial markets. So just a few house, a uh, few pieces of housekeeping before we begin. Of course, it is an interactive live webinar, so do make use of the fact that you can ask questions throughout the webinar. It is, of course, a learning experience, so do avail of that. You can locate your chat box there on the right-hand side of your screen. So at any point throughout uh, the webinar, if you post questions, I'll be able to see them and correspond with you guys. Uh, this live webinar is being recorded and will be placed into your members area once the webinar has concluded so roughly it takes us one hour to process the video and upload it, upload it for revision purposes into your members area and of course we like to have a quick q a session towards the end of the webinar to deal with any concerns that you may have throughout the education so let's move on then to observe our course overview we are of course uh, starting with uh, lesson three this morning the essential knowledge is the focus of our lesson before entering our first live practical trading workshop lesson uh, tomorrow. During this lesson, we will be discussing the different forms of market analysis. So whether you'd like to trade the markets more short ter term or long term, um, do you prefer fundamental analysis over technical analysis and, and using the different indicators and tools to assert a price action? We'll be, I suppose, delving deep into those different uh, forms of analysis. We'll be discussing then some of the main principles in terms of how these markets move um, as irrational economic agents and how we observe price movement. So there is, of course, liquidity in markets. There's uh, forms of illiquidity when there's uh, difficulty between price action and, and discovery. There's volatility, of course, in markets. Uh, there's the amount of risk or leverage factor that you decide to take as a trader. All of these are very, very closely coincided into uh, your performance as a trader based on your expectation and how much risk appetite you observe and take in the markets. And then we'll be finishing off with practical elements of trading. What does this mean when we actually discuss things like volatility and leverage and, and how does it actually affect us when observing uh, the trading platform and placing trades? So we'll be bringing that sort of practical element to the end of today's lesson, setting us up for a very enjoyable lesson tomorrow with lesson four there, a practical trading workshop. So do look forward to that. So without any further ado, let us uh, go into a bit more detail just with the lesson outline as discussed. We will be discussing the different types of analysis with fundamental and technical trading, rationality with markets, liquidity, volatility, leverage, those, those practical elements of trading. So in terms of the, the trading platform, we'll be looking and discussing what is the PIP, the PIP location of markets, what are the transactional costs to actually entering these markets and, and performing, and that is known as the spread, which is the, the cost between the bid and ask of a particular price, then we'll delve into risk. Uh, I, I suppose practicality of trading risk is the best way to explain lots and leverage effect. We'll be discussing margin and, and the effect that has on your overall performance of account and the relevance of risk in terms of your own trading expectation. Combining all of these, um, I suppose, practical elements with uh, volatility, leverage, the leverage effect and the lot sizes, how they actually all combine into a structured level of even placing one trade and what that trade means in terms of notional trade size. So let's jump head first in then with market analysis and what I'd like to discuss first of all is our first school of thought. So really we have two or three main schools of thought as traders. The first being fundamental analysis, which is really the examination of the underlying forces that affect the well-being of an economy industry group or company. As with, with most analysis, the goal is to derive a forecast and profit from future price movements. 
So it is focused on analyzing the fundamentals of an economy, whether you're trading something like a, a, an equity index, whether it be the S&P 500 there in the US, whether you're trading an industry group or, and more particular a share within that uh, group. So it may be uh, something within the tech sector. You might be looking at those um, those group of companies like Comcast, Cisco Systems, uh, Facebook, Microsoft, all of these tech groups, of course, that industry itself and how it's performing or whether you're looking to analyze one particular company within that industry group and analyze that from a fundamental basis. So if you're looking at Google and you're choosing to to study its uh, profit earnings or corporate reports or its performance or organic growth within the sector, you'll be looking to really delve deep in, into crunching the numbers fundamentally there to assert a level of performance. So it, it is very much structured on what's fundamentally happening behind the scenes with each particular market in question. Technical analysis then, our second, uh, secondary school of thought, is a methodology for forecasting the direction of prices through the study of past market data. So primarily we look to look at a price and volume. So historical price and volume to sort of ask questions to whether there's levels in the market that the, that the market will not trade through or will look to break through, whether the Japanese candlesticks or our observation of price action can give us an observation to uh, buyers and sellers and how they're looking to move the market in one particular direction. So there are <clears throat> many different technical tools that we can actually look to implement across the market price action uh, to assertively forecast future price movement. And effectively, of course, that's what we're trying to do to buy and sell markets with the hope of profit. And in our tertiary um, school of thought would be sentimental analysis. This really focuses on identifying and measuring the overall psychological state of all participants in the market. It attempts to necessarily quantify what percentage of markets are either buyers or sellers. And of course, we call those participants bulls and bears. So effectively, what we're trying to do here as a sentimental anal uh, analyst is to understand the psychological state of the, the economy or whatever market we're, we're choosing to trade. That is something that maybe didn't um, arrive to us straight away when we think about trading these markets, but we know all of these participants that are entering these markets, they have a certain a gauge of sentiments or a level of confidence. Certainly, even when we study fundamental analysis, well, some of the most important data, economic data points across the globe in the US, in Germany, there in France, in the UK, they're actually focused on, on sentiment confidence, consumer consumers, um, consumer confidence, you know, sentiment analysis, PMIs. These are sort of sentiment figures that push the markets one way or another. So the significance of those as economic data points shows us that traders or market participants actually get involved trading the markets purely based off a gauge of sentiment. So that is what we really try to, to do, gauge a level of quantifiable uh, bullish or bearish sentiments within these markets. So let's have a, a perspective over a, an equity index and actually try and trade this market. The question I would like to pose really is, well, how do traders analyze the markets? Okay, now we've discussed three schools of thought, but how might we put that into practice? How might traders analyze, them, analyze this market? So we have, first of all, fundamental analysis. Well, just to point out, the first thing we'll do as a fundamental trader is understand the market. So we want to understand that we're trading an equity index, the China A50, it's a blue chip equity index, and it's highly dominated there by industrials. We know that China itself uh, has, has a varied range of different sectors that contribute to the economy. An overwhelming contributing factor is the industrial revolution in China. So industry is very important. Construction is also very important. So it is heavily reliant on such commodities such as oil, uh, commodities such as iron, steel, copper. So what we would call uh, industrial commodities. So we are now in a very strong bull run and we can see that these commodities as well are effectively uh, starting to have lift off in terms of strength as global growth continues. So with a little analysis, we can assertively say, well, we're in a bull run here. We can see this trend to the upside. So let's try and get involved again. 
perhaps we know that at this particular point of time there's been a, sh a short sell-off in the market but everything is actually posing to show strength and continued upside in china so this may be a fundamental buying point we could particularly look at the forex pair and we know that the the chinese one has questionably devalued over the last um you know sort of three to four years and it's continuing to show that sort of movement um that would in terms of fundamental fundamental trading that would suggest that well these prices are going to be supported by a more competitive one and will see continued rise to the upside so we've discussed you know the chinese economy the bull cycle the business cycle itself where we're at the fact that china is heavily involved in industry and construction and that's pr you know providing real support and that the, the currency itself is providing equity support so some preliminary uh, sort of analysis to suggest that we are continuing to look for potential to buy this market on a fundamental basis so how might we actually think to trade this market with technical analysis as well with their secondary school of thought well again very very simple technical analysis would suggest simply by looking at the trend that we are of course in a very strong channel or trend to the upside so this is effectively our long-term price channel here we can look to actually get involved when we see lows like this here so lows within the market technically a series of lower lows here we see what we would call um i suppose a level of so a genuine level of support and resistance just at this price level here so that can provide some support in the market to try and look for future price movement again if these highs are breaking with our, our, our level of price consolidation we can look to break this level for upside movement so again some simple technical analysis just to suggest as a trader where is price moving to and how can we get involved again just to observe uh, the structure of japanese candlesticks again what we could literally do is just observe you know counter counter trend trades as well so we see we've effectively touched the top of our trend uh, our channel here the candle is very supportive of indecision with the spinning top and the next candle is very conclusive to to show us that there's a potential movement to the downside here the first candle here our uh, bullish engulfing candle is effectively outdone by the the sell candle the the bearish candle and um, two days later and that would be significant to show us some uh, future price movement so we can use this technical analysis to get heavily involved heavily active in these markets to look for a different point of views to trade these markets so we have an overall view of how to trade fundamentally and technically now what we can do is just try and gauge a level of sentiment generally in the markets and again sentimental analysis is our ter tertiary uh, school of thought so what we look to do is again simply try and quantify the percentage of buyers and sellers in this market so it'd be buyers versus sellers okay so what we can see of course is that we are in a very strong bull trend again when the markets are trending we can take samples to say well we have you know a few candlesticks in a row that the bulls are simply taking over so what is the risk appetite within this level the risk appetite is certainly a risk on approach it's a bullish approach and that would simply signify to us that well there is sentiment strong sentiment as this market shifts away from this range that the market is looking to continue to the upside again when this these conditions change we see this level here we see sentiment shift to the downside well then there's more of a risk off approach and our sentiment isn't as strong that there's going to be potential continued move to the upside we might actually assert that we are <clears throat> more on the bullish uh, sorry the bearish side in the short term that may be the case and again we can use these different types of analysis to assert a, a level of confidence in different trading positions okay so a lot of traders do actually like to quantify a hybrid approach to trading um, with these markets and that answers our question well how do traders analyze the markets so let's move on to discussing trading rationale so the first question again i would like to pose don't be afraid to to chat and you know put some answers there in relation to these questions into the chat box there 
do you consider yourself a rational consumer? So again, just if you're an economic consumer, you're going into the marketplace, perhaps you're doing some shopping there, grocery shopping at the weekend. Well, do you consider yourself a rational consumer when the latest iPhone 8 is released to the markets? Do you simply want to buy it because it's released or are you rational in terms of how it's priced in relation to other handsets? That is a question for all of us as economic agents. So there's no, I suppose it's a very simple approach in terms of trading in the markets as well. We all attach a notion of value when we go out as consumers into the marketplace. <clears throat> Perhaps we will choose not to buy a product if we believe it is too expensive or overvalued. So how does this relate to the markets? You know, do we assert sometimes that, well, oil, the oil market is rallying, it's very strong. Oh, I just can't buy it now because it was at $50 there a few days ago, now it's at $55 or $60. That's just too expensive for me to buy. Well, the question really is, do we carry the same approach to the markets and trade because we believe an asset is under or overvalued? And that at times is certainly the case. So this all leads into discussing you know, trading rationale with markets. We have investment. So the, the investment community trade, of course, with rationale. They try and assert value. So if I believe that there are three strong companies, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft, they're leading the way in the tech sector. Well, which one of those are, are potentially overpriced? And which one is potentially underpriced given the sector, sector is growing? My decision, of course, as an investor will to try and uh, source a value and purchase some shares in the, the one that I think is undervalued in a strong sector. Whereas if we consult active trading, we are quite objective in profit. We don't necessarily or should not necessarily focus in on whether um, a market is good in terms of trading it because it's it provides value. We want to get involved in the technicalities of trading and look to capture pip movements as the markets move in and out of, of volatility. So active trading is more focused on profit objectivity. And the markets, of course, often price assets irrationally, totally irrationally. And that is something that I'd just like to leave when we discuss trading rational. Um, as, a, as a lesson or a general rule of thumb, you're never going to experience very, very calm and, and forgiving market conditions um, consistent at a consistent rate. If we just discuss a potential market like Bitcoin, you know, something that traded from $2,000 in August there, 2017, to $20,000 in December 2017, shows you that, well, what is the basis behind this movement? Potentially, this market is trading irrationally. And if I, even if I'm correct in my view of this market and how it should be priced in the long term, and we're yet to find out, of, of course, we're with an asset like this. The market still can trade irrationally for a long period of time and um, so that is very important to start to price that into your trading and of course that's why we we always want to use stop losses and manage risks because the markets can trade irrationally let's move on then to liquidity and what liquidity really is in, in terms of definition well it's when an asset or security becomes harder to buy or sell because a lack of ready and willing traders available to buy or sell the asset so a lack of ready and willing traders available to buy or sell. So again, if there's less volume or there's less traders in a market, well, of course, price discovery will be more dispersed, more distributed, and it'll be harder to actually find a buyer at the price that you want or vice versa for a seller. Markets are more liquid when they are experiencing higher trading volume and less liquid when they are experiencing lower trading volume. The Forex markets are considered the most liquid of all markets as millions of dollars of currency exchange hands each day. So absolutely millions of dollars. And to give you one example, the single currency pair, the, the euro dollar, has effectively the most volume traded per day at an average capital of three trillion, uh, three trillion US dollars um, traded hands on the Forex markets per day in that one currency. So it just shows you the, the level of tra financial transactions moving across the globe each day. Markets are and can become illiquid when price discovery is questionable. And I've discussed Bitcoin and market uncertainty and how uh, you know how that level of uncertainty when markets move, potentially two or $3,000 a day, like Bitcoin, how 
that liquidity becomes into the market because there's more fear or uncertainty of price or or um, differences in price movement and frequency. And the level of participation in the market is the key factor. So what I'd like to do is just to show you a quick example and discuss it through in terms of, this is our key point when discussing liquidity. The participation of both buyers and sellers is absolutely the key factor. So here, what I'd like you to do is just to consider the structure of commercial marketplaces. So here we have a more common bespoke um, Sunday marketplace. It's a fruit and veg market. Opposing there with the picture on the right hand side, side excuse me, of a financial marketplace, and um, particularly there, this is the New York Mercantile Stock Exchange. So, a congregation of buyers and sellers trading, you know, global assets like oil, gold, sugar, equities, equity indices, and um, credit, you know, interest rate swaps, a lot of difficult products, financially engineered products, but with a lot of volume. They are backed by all of the financial institutions and they can make quite a large amount of transactional trades. What is the difference between these two markets when discussing the liquidity? Well, in figure number one there, we can see that, okay, the level of participation is, is quite good for a Sunday market, but it's not as busy. It's not as busy. There, that would mean there's not the same amount of buyers and sellers looking to compete over those prices. So there will be a, a more fluctuating discrepancy over price the fact that one seller or buyer can go to the market and quote a price of $50, another might quote a price of $52. What's likely to happen there with figure number two is that there's higher degree, a much higher degree of competition. And as one trader offers a price of $50, the next trader might offer the price of $50.10. You know, so it's much more compact. There's much more participation in uh, the market. And what it effectively, effectively leads to is uh, high liquidity over low liquidity. Okay, so market participation, the level of volume and participation is key in defining liquidity. Some markets are intrinsically illiquid. So again, some markets which are more, um, I suppose, exotic markets, even if we use the Forex markets, although they are very liquid, the more exotic pairs, the New Zealand dollar against the Russian ruble, for example, will be less liquid than a very liquid market like the US dollar against the euro. Liquidity can enter and leave markets. And again, this may result in times where you have a very liquid market like the euro dollar, but potentially we are seeing a figure of importance being introduced to the market. Perhaps it's the non farm payrolls towards the end of the month where there's a, a severe level of uncertainty for a short limited period of time. What's going to happen there is both buyers and sellers are going to leave, they're going to disperse from the market at that period of time, creating illiquidity in the short term. Trading illiquid markets or during illiquid times can deliver poor price execution again. So because there's illiquidity, we might not see as much competition for price and therefore price discovery or price execution may be more difficult. And we need to develop our decision-making abilities to protect ourselves. Now, what does that mean? Well, now that we know that we have liquidity in different markets or illiquidity in other markets, or at times there's, of course, intrinsic liquidity because of a volatility or uncertainty at specific periods of time. Well, the question is, which markets do we trade and what times, what times do we want to be trading these markets at? So very important to really look to protect yourself in terms of understanding liquidity. Now liquidity itself is coincided, it does coincide indeed with volatility. Why is that? Well, let's discuss volatility and try and match them together. Volatility refers to the amount of uncertainty or risk about the size of changes in a security's price. So the size of changes and both the frequency of movement in that security's price will result in volatility. The higher the volatility, the larger the fluctuations in price movement over a period of time. And thus, the lower the volatility, the less price moves over a period of time. Okay, so the more uncertainty of, of price movement, well, there's a degree of volatility there. In general, a security is said to have a higher degree of risk if it is more volatile. So, of course, again, we can use our Bitcoin example. You know, many people, many traders liked to enjoy the volatility, liked to assert themselves to a higher degree of risk because if something can move two thousand dollars a day well isn't that great if you can try and capture that profit what you do need to do is be aware of that risk and trade effectively 
So the question again, it leads us nicely to discussing, which I'd like to pose to our students online today is, what do we think for, for volatility? Is that good or bad for traders? Okay, volatility, the fact that assets can move and experience great price movement, is that good for uh, both buyers and sellers in these markets? Okay, and I can see some comments here unanimously coming in there as this is good for traders, a few bad ones as well. So yes, the answer is it's good. Volatility is very good for us. It's potentially very, very uh, rewarding for us. What we need to understand is how to trade volatility properly with associations of risk. Okay, so what I'll do is actually try and depict this to um, with some um, physical price action here. So again, a hypothetical question. Which section here of the price action experiences the most volatile price action? So we have a figure one, two, and three. It's the same market now, just to avoid some confusion here, I'll just highlight the fact that this is the same market. Okay, so this is the S&P 500. The entire price action here is subject to a long-term trend to the upside in the S&P 500. So I'll just highlight that there. So effectively, the answer is, of course, number three. It is, of course, experiencing the, mo the most volatility by far. It is very volatile. What we can see is a, a large trend a break to the downside. And what we can highlight from that is that this is much more volatile because we see, you know, larger ATRs with the candlesticks here, particularly comparatively to some of the candlesticks previous, uh, previously viewed on price action here. They're quite timid, quite calm. So that can conclude that, of course, three here is the most volatile price action, most certainly. Again, which of these markets is the most volatile? So these are three particularly different markets. And uh, what I'll do is just highlight these markets. So we have um, the SPI, which is um, the Australian Equity Index. We have the dollar index. Then we have the euro dollar here. So which of these markets is the most potentially the most volatile again to define it it's the most uncertainty over larger shifts in price action and more frequent shifts in price action so of course the answer here is um well slide number one here the s p uh sorry spi 200 because we're seeing major changes in the price um, in shorter time periods the frequency of price changes is more rapid and more much more volatile as you can see where these are experiencing a little volatility, of course, but much more timid and much more um, trend trading in terms of their price action. Okay, so moving on from volatility, let's then look at leverage. And, and what I'd like to do is just really highlight that leverage is essentially the multiplier. So it's essentially the multiplier to our trade decisions. Practically on our trading platforms, we'll look to trade a multiplier of our capital. Okay, and that is effectively leverage. Leverage makes trading the financial markets more accessible to you and me. So what that means is, well, we can trade large amounts of capital in the currency pair. We can trade the price of cocoa or sugar or gold or the oil market. So a whole range of different products that we can trade simply by using leverage from a broker on a trading platform. Leverage is essentially then the rate of multiplication you wish to trade. So it's the multiplier effect. So what I'd like to do is just give you one example. Again, if we're trading a Forex pair and we decide to trade a 0 0.01 lot, well, that's effectively trading 1,000 euro if it's the euro dollar of capital against the dollar. So effectively, we can gain a much larger exposure to access of capital. This multiplication of your funds held on deposit allows you to trade bigger size and access more markets and leverage allows you to pay less than full price for a trade giving you the ability to enter larger positions than would be possible with your own funds alone so again if we are looking to trade a forex pair we don't need 1000 euros to trade 1000 euros of value we potentially need 100 euros uh, and we can uh, effectively enter to that position and um, with increasing the risk or exposure on the trade through leverage